Sugar has been part of the human diet since ancient times. It was introduced to the Western world by the Arabs, who brought both the plant and the knowledge for its cultivation to Sicily and Spain in the 8th and 9th centuries. However, sugar remained an expensive spice until the 1800s, mainly due to the difficulty involved in its production. But the Industrial Revolution changed all that, and now the industry is worth $67 billion. So how is it made? In the US, an estimated 55 to 60% of all the sugar produced comes from beets, while the rest comes from sugarcane. Interestingly, both these sources need different weather conditions to grow. Sugarcane is primarily grown in tropical and subtropical regions, while sugar beets are cultivated in cooler climates. The process starts with choosing suitable land for farming. The land should have good drainage, access to water, and fertile soil. In the case of sugarcane, it is mainly grown from stem cuttings called scents, while sugar beets are grown from seeds. On average, it takes the sugarcane plant 12 to 16 months to mature. Once it does, it's time for the harvest season. In the US, the harvesting of sugarcane is done with specialized machinery. Once the sugarcane is harvested, it is fed into the base of a conveyor that drops it onto a transport bin that follows alongside. This sugarcane is then loaded onto trucks that deliver it to the mill. Once at a mill, trucks unload their cargo onto a receiving table along with the soil and rock. But for it to be ready for the next step, it must be as clean as possible. For this purpose, the cane is put on a conveyor belt that moves the cane through strong water jets and combing drums to remove large amounts of rock, trash, and leaves. Then, the cane's hard structure is broken down in a crusher, where rotating hammers smash the cane into smaller pieces. The crushed cane is then put into a milling tandem that's designed to squeeze out the sweet juice from it. Inside the milling tandem, the crushed cane goes through a series of five or more mills. Large cylinders press the cane fiber, extracting as much juice as possible. The juice is then directed into a channel away from the bagasse. The dried pulp left after the juice has been extracted. The leftover pulp, or bagasse, is not wasted and can be used as fuel. The process is monitored at each mill to ensure quality control. Finally, a vat collects the juice that flows from the top and bottom of the mills. Now that the juice has been successfully extracted from the sugarcane, it's time to process it. But before this can be done, the sugarcane juice undergoes a series of tests at the sugar mill's lab. In these tests, the juice is purified and then analyzed using a polarimeter, with the most important factor being checked being the sugar concentration of the juice. This is done for various reasons. It not only ensures consistent quality, but also helps improve processing, determines sugar yield, sets fair prices, meets regulations, and supports scientific research and development. The sugarcane juice then flows down a 10-meter high tower while sulfur dioxide vapors rise through it. This method is called sulfitation. It keeps the juice fresh by stopping the growth of bacteria and also evens out its slight acidity. In a separate container, workers mix powdered lime with water to make a solution, which they later combine with the juice. A device stirs the cane and lime juice together for about six hours to finish a process known as alkalization. This step adjusts the juice's pH level and makes it clearer. Due to the lime, the color of the juice changes from brown to yellow. Then, the juice moves to tanks for clarification to remove any remaining dirt. The juice needs over two hours to settle, allowing the dirt to sink to the tank's bottom. The leftover dirt, referred to as mud, isn't discarded right away. Workers sift through the mud to pull out any leftover sugar. Once the sugar is removed, they use the remaining mud as fertilizer for the cane fields. The juice, now clean, is heated in several evaporators. Each evaporator is under higher pressure, so the sugar heats at a cooler temperature. This part of the process eliminates about two-thirds of the water in the juice, increasing the sugar concentration from 15% to an impressive 60%. 
Afterward, the juice is stored in 15-ton tanks to further remove impurities. Any remaining dirt rises to the top of the tank, where it's pushed to the sides by a rotating paddle. The final tank produces a type of syrup with 65% solids and 35% water. Crystallization is the next step in sugar manufacturing. This process happens in a single-stage vacuum pan, where the syrup is evaporated until it is saturated with sugar. Once the saturation point is exceeded, workers introduce sucrose crystals suspended in alcohol into the syrup. These sucrose crystals act as seed crystals that provide a surface for new sugar crystals to form. By adding these seed crystals to the syrup, they serve as nuclei for the crystallization process, initiating the growth of new crystals more quickly and uniformly. The growth of the crystals continues until the pan is full. When the sucrose concentration reaches the desired level, the dense mixture of syrup and sugar crystals, called masochite, is moved into large containers known as crystallizers. Crystallization continues in the crystallizers as the masochite is slowly stirred and cooled. The syrup is then transferred into a high-speed centrifugal machine, which separates the sugar crystals from the remaining remaining syrup. Inside, the sugar spins at 1,200 revolutions per minute. The mother liquor, or molasses, is filtered out from the sugar crystals, which stay inside the perforated centrifugal basket while the molasses drains away. The crystals are then washed with a fine jet of water to remove most of the syrup coating, producing raw sugar of high purity. Raw sugar from the centrifuges contains 97 to 99 percent sugar crystals. These damp sugar crystals are dried by being circulated through heated air in a granulator, reducing the moisture content of the sugar to about 0.02 percent, which is the standard for table sugar. The dry sugar crystals are then funneled out of the dryer and into a bag that can hold 1,000 kilos. A hoist then transports the bags to a packing facility. The hoist can carry three bags at a time, totaling 3,000 kilos, a very heavy load. It lowers each bag into a chute that leads to the factory's main floor, where workers carefully open each bag and pour out the sugar into the chute. This chute leads to an automated packaging machine that fills two kilo plastic bags. Keeping the mill clean is a crucial part of quality control. Scientific studies have shown that even a small amount of sour bagus fiber residue from sugarcane can contaminate the entire flow of warm juice passing over it. To prevent this, modern mills use self-cleaning troughs designed with a proper slope to ensure that bagasse does not accumulate and flows out with the juice stream. Strict measures are taken to control insects and pests within the mill premises. Efficient transportation methods for the quick delivery of sugarcane to the mills are critical due to the rapid spoilage of the cane. Automation has been implemented to streamline transportation processes and reduce delays, ensuring that the cane reaches the mills quickly. Preserving the high quality of the final product requires careful storage of brown and yellow refined sugars, which usually contain 2 to 5 percent moisture. These sugars are kept in a cool and somewhat humid environment to maintain their moisture content and prevent them from hardening. If you have a sweet tooth, why not check out our How Chocolate Is Made video right here. Subscribe to our channel for more interesting videos on how other households are made.